Tree shaking, the horticulturally misguided algorithm. I know, you're like, what? I just clicked a video about WebAssembly. Why am I reading about this? I promise it'll all make sense as we go forward because tree shaking, WebAssembly, JavaScript, and the state of the browser, they're all a bit of a mess. This article from my quick skim seemed really cool and I'm excited to dive in with y'all. Let's talk about tree shaking, looking up through the trough. But first, I need to talk about WebAssembly's dirty secret. Despite all of the hype, WebAssembly has had limited success on the web. Limited is putting it lightly. It's very rare we actually use Wasm for anything other than like image and video processing online. Very few sites are using Wasm to control what you see as you explore the site. There are very few sites where you click a button and then Wasm deals with whatever is supposed to happen as a result. Incredibly rare. There is Photoshop, which does appear to be a real success. Five years ago, there was Figma, but they don't talk much about the Wasm stuff these days. There are quite a number of little NPM libraries that use Wasm under the hood, usually compiled from C++ or Rust. I think Blazor probably gets used for a few in-house corporate apps, though I could be fooled by their marketing. You might recall the hyped demos of 3D first-person shooter games with Unreal Engine, again, from five years ago. But that was the previous major release of Unreal, and was always experimental. The current Unreal 5 version does not support targeting Wasm. I didn't actually know that, but I haven't seen any good Unreal demos in the browser in a long time, so it does make sense. Don't get me wrong, I think WebAssembly is great. It is having a fine success in the off-the-web environments, and I think it's going to be a key and growing part of the web platform. I suspect, though, that we're only just now getting past the trough of disillusionment. This is a classic, my favorite startup chart, where technology happens, we get really hyped, we realize the hype's not real, we crash, and then we slowly get to where things actually make sense. Very, very common. This is the experience running a startup. This is the experience learning a new technology. This is the experience doing basically anything hard that has any part that's fun. We're deep here in Wasm right now. It's worth reflecting a bit on the nature of Web's Wasm successes and the failures as well. Take Photoshop as an example. I think we can say that Wasm does very well at bringing large C++ programs to the web. I know that it took quite some work, but I understand the end result to be essentially the same source code, just compiled for a different target. Similarly for the JavaScript module case, Wasm finds success in getting legacy C++ code onto the web, also as a way to write new web targeting Rust code. There are often tasks that JavaScript doesn't do very well at, or which need a shared implementation between client and server deployments. On the other hand, Wasm has not been a web success for DOM-heavy apps. Nobody is talking about rewriting the front end of WordPress.com in Wasm, for example. Depends on which communities you ask, although I will say, it seems like that has stopped. We were definitely in a bit of a phase where people were pretending they could just rewrite their whole website in Rust in Wasm. That's not a real thing anymore, and I'm happy we're over it. Why is that? It may sound like a silly question to you. Wasm just isn't that good at that stuff. But why? If you dig down a bit, I think it's that the programming models are just too different. The web's primary programming model is JS, a language with dynamic typing and managed memory, whereas Wasm 1.0 was about static typing and linear memory. Getting to the DOM from Wasm was a hassle that was overcome only by the most ardent of the true Wasm faithful. Relatedly, Wasm has also not really been a success for languages that aren't like C or Rust. I am guessing that WordPress.com isn't written mostly in C++. One of the sticking points for this class of language is that C Sharp, for example, will want to ship with a garbage collector and that it's annoying to have to do this. Check my article from March this year for more details. Interesting point I hadn't thought of. For C Sharp to run in Wasm, they have to write their own garbage collector in Wasm. And now you're dealing with a gigantic bundle. Oh, apparently UE5 is back on the web now. Thank you for the correction from chat, Snowsquire. Appreciate you. Happily, this restriction is going away, as all browsers are going to ship support for reference types and garbage collection within the next few months. Chrome and Firefox have already shipped Wasm garbage collection, and Safari shouldn't be far behind thanks to the efforts from my colleague, Asumu Taki... Takikawa? Hopefully I got your name right. This is an extraordinarily exciting development that I think will kick off a whole nother Gartner hype cycle as more languages start to update their tool chains to support Wasm. If you don't like my peaches, oh boy. This brings us to the meat of today's note. Web Wasm will win where compilers create compact code. If your language's compiler toolchain can manage to produce useful Wasm in a file that's less than a handful of over the wire kilobytes, you actually have a chance to win. If your compiler can't do that, you'll have to instead rely on hype and captured audiences for adoption, which at best results in an unstable equilibrium until you figure out what's next. Whew, we're getting spicy spicy here. I like this a lot. In the JS world, managing bloat in deliverable sizes is a huge industry. Yeah, we've spent so much time talking about bundlers. How many of my recent videos are arguably about bundlers? If we just go to my channel, where you can see them live right now, by the way, Coral Only Videos Live. This one's about bundlers. We're at one so far. I was expecting this to be slightly worse, honestly. I talk about bundlers a lot. Package managers, kind of the same deal. We'll count that, so we're at two. This one's about JS bundlers being rewritten from Go to Rust, so that counts for sure. We're at three. 
Winter JS is different runtime, so I can't quite count it, even though it's competing with Bun, which is also a bundler. I talk about bundlers a lot, although I will make the point that my most recent bundler video kind of bombed, so it seems like the ecosystem might be burnt out on bundlers. We'll figure out what that means in the future. Anyways, bundlers like ESBuild are a ubiquitous part of the toolchain, compiling down a set of JS modules to a single file that should include only the functions and data types that are used in a program, and additionally applying domain-specific size-squishing strategies, such as minification, which makes monikers more minuscule. So if you give something a big name, minification makes the name small. Good stuff. Let's focus on tree shaking. Yes, the thing that this article is supposedly actually about, even though the impact on WebAssembly is one of the most important pieces. So let's focus on tree shaking. The visual metaphor is that you write a bunch of code and you only need some of it for any given page. So you imagine a tree whose um, branches are the modules that you use and whose leaves are the individual definitions in that module. And then you violently shake the tree, probably killing it and also annoying any nested birds. The only thing that's left still attached is what is actually needed. I have a feeling after reading this, this guy's not going to like tree shaking too much, although a beautiful analogy. This isn't how trees work, though. Holding the trunk doesn't give you information as to which branches are somehow necessary for the tree's mission. It also primes your mind to look for the wrong fixed point, removing unneeded code instead of keeping only the necessary code. Interesting point. What does this link to? Fixed point and strike mandates. This is from over 10 years ago. This looks like a math thing. I'm not smart enough for that. I'm a JavaScript dev. But tree shaking's an evocative name, and so despite its horticultural and algorithmic inaccuracies, we'll stick to it. Fair. It's a fun name, even if it means nothing. <laughs> the thing is that the maximal tree shaking for languages with a thicker runtime has not been a huge priority. Consider Go. According to the Golang wiki, the most trivial program compiled to Wasm from Go is two megabytes. <laughs> Ugh. That, that's just not tenable. And adding imports can make this go to 10 megs or more. Or look at Pyodide, a Python WebAssembly port. The REPL example downloads about 20 megs of data. These are fine sizes for tech demos or, in the limit, very rich applications, but they aren't winners for web dev. This is a very important key I think people miss. If you're building rich applications that are heavily interactive, things like Photoshop or Figma, where there's a lot of graphical transformations and heavy math done in order to make the experience good, downloading a few megs of data to make that experience better is reasonable. If this is the baseline for entry, writing your website for your blog in Go or Python is incredibly dumb. And it's a huge gap between the web that we use every day and the technologies that people are excited about for the web. Like this gap is just so big in the expectations, the way browsers work, the size of these bundles that it's hard to take anyone seriously who thinks the future of the web is rust. So let's shake a different tree. To be fair, both the built-in Wasm support for Go and Pyodide ports of Python derive from the upstream tool chains, where producing small binaries is nice but not necessary. On a server, who cares how big the app is? Oh boy, server component plug? I will say one of my favorite things about server components is the fact that I can just have giant code and not worry about it getting to the user because only the parts the user is actually like rendering and consuming on client are shipped to them. Watch any of my server component videos to hear more about that. The one about airplane proof code is a really good example of this. And indeed, when targeting smaller devices, we tend to see alternative implementations of the toolchain. For example, MicroPython or TinyGo. TinyGo has a Wasm backend that can apparently go down to less than a kilobyte even. Interesting. Never heard of TinyGo. Interesting. It reuses libraries used by the Go language tools alongside LLVM. We never started Go to be an embedded language, and so it got serious problems. <laughs> oh, Rob Pike. I love Rob's honesty. I just don't love his design decisions, his choices, his language, or much else about him. But at least he's honest. And that's a pretty great quote to admit that Go in embedded systems is terrible. <laughs> Apparently, TinyGo actually keeps the Go memory model, which implies garbage collection of some sort. Very interesting project. The original reasoning was, if Python can run on microcontrollers, then certainly Go should be able to run on even lower level micros. It is kind of funny that Python could go lower level than Go. Pretty funny concept. These alternative tool chains often come with some restrictions or peculiarities. Let's take a look at the differences with TinyGo. TinyGo Piler implements all major Go language features, although some details are missing. If you're wondering, does TinyGo support feature X? We often cannot give a good answer. The rest of this page gives a good indication, but other than that, you will just have to try for yourself to see whether a particular piece of software works with TinyGo. 
So Seago isn't going to work great. Reflection, uh, yeah, it, there's a custom reflect package that's been re-implemented and it mostly works. Maps generally work fine, but maybe slower than you expect them to be. There are a few reasons for this, one of which is that some types, like structs, may internally be compared using reflection instead of using a dedicated hash compare function. There's a bunch of standard library stuff that is not supported, but uh, they have a list of the things that do compile, but compiling does not imply that it works entirely. Oh boy. Garbage collection. Generally works fine, but may not work as well on very small chips and on WebAssembly. It is also a lot slower than the usual Go Garbage Collector. Good to know. So it does work on Wasm, but not as well. And it's also very slow. So we just saw there are definitely some differences here. And although we can consider this to be an evil of sorts, it is to be expected that the target platform exhibits some co-design feedback on the language. Fair point. I do think that we've been spoiled nowadays that like Windows, Mac, and Linux are finally getting to a point where we can target them without having to write too much custom code for each one. But we're like just getting there like just barely. So the idea that the platform, in this case, the web and Wasm should have some say over the language? Yes, but also, ugh. In particular, running in the sea of the DOM is sufficiently weird that a Wasm targeting Python program will necessarily be different than a native Python program. To be fair, UI in Python has been a mess for literally ever. So Python having a real UI layer, in this case, the DOM, sounds actually pretty compelling, but yeah, it is fundamentally different from how we write native Python. Still, I think as toolchain authors, we aim to provide the same language, albeit possibly with a different implementation of the STL. I am sure that the ClojureScript developers would prefer to remove their page documenting the differences with Clojure if they could. And perhaps if Wasm was to become a viable target for ClojureScript, they will. On the algorithm, to recap, now that it supports GC, Wasm could be a winner for web development in Python and other languages. You would need a different tool chain and an effective tree shaking algorithm so that user experience does not degrade. So let's talk about the tree shaking. Oh boy. I work on the Hoot scheme compiler, which targets Wasm with garbage collection. Is this guy a scheme guy? Are you kidding? I also love when you're not signed into GitLab, there's the why GitLab button because they're trying so hard to pull people over. Who is the code name for the Guile WebAssembly project launched by the Sprightly Institute? In addition to the compiler, Hoot contains a full WebAssembly toolchain with a Watt parser, an assembler, a disassembler, an interpreter, etc. Is Guile like the new scheme? Yeah, it's an implementation of Scheme. Yeah, they, they really are putting Scheme in the freaking browser. Blah. Regardless, if this guy's putting Scheme in the browser, he knows what he's talking about. This just way overqualified him for every other point he said. <laughs> This is gonna be fun. So he's working on the Hoot Scheme compiler, which targets Wasm with GC. We managed to get down to 70 kilobytes or so right now in the minimal main compilation unit, and we are aiming for lower. Auxiliary compilation units that import runtime facilities, the current exception handlers and such, from the main module can be sub kilobytes. Being sub one kilobyte for a module in Wasm is actually pretty huge. Getting here has been tricky though, and I think it would be even trickier for Python. Some background, like whiff, or whiffle? What the fuck's a whiffle? You scheme people are insane. So whatever Wiffle is, some other alternative to scheme, or some other scheme-based thing. The Hoot compiler prepends a prelude onto user code. Tree shaking happens in a number of places. There's partial evaluation, which will evaluate unused bindings for effect, possibly eluding them. Or eliding. Yeah. Why does this guy like these words? Overall, this has been a very readable article, but what the fuck's eliding? Fixing let rec will do the same. CBS is like something about call. So they're checking to see how often things are called, following only reference functions, values, and control edges, like renumbering. There's an explicit dead code elimination pass which tries to elide unused effect-free allocations, a situation that can arise due to other optimizations. Finally, there's a standard library, which is written in raw-ish Wasm, whose definitions, like global, tables, imports, functions, etc., are included in the residual binary only as needed. Generally speaking, procedure definitions, like functions and closures, are the easy part. You just include only the functions that are referenced by the code. In a language like Scheme, this gets you a long way. However, there are three immediate challenges. One is that the evaluation model for the definitions in the prelude is let rec star. The scope is recursive, but ordered. Binding values can call or refer to previously defined values or capture values defined later. Evaluating the value of a binding requires referring to a value only defined later, then that's an error. Again, for procedures, this is trivially okay, but as soon as you have non-procedure definitions, sometimes the compiler won't be able to prove this nice only refers to earlier bindings property. In the case that fixing let rec reloaded algorithm will end up residualizing bindings that are set, which all of the tree shaking passes above require the delicate DCE pass. Okay. I knew early into this paragraph that this was smart people speak, but by the end, yeah. 
if I understand correctly, this is saying that it's hard to know if a value is actually being used unless it's within a isolated procedure. Ooh, Chris is here helping too. Finally, smart compiler people. CPS goes to the one process child. <laughs> Never mind. Thought you were going to be helpful, Chris. My mistake. I saw your name. I saw the abbreviation and assumed you were going to have you helpful. <laughs> well, I got trolled. I'll take the L. Worse, some of these non-procedure definitions are record types, which have vtables that define how to print a record, how to check if a value is an instance of the record, and so on. These vtable callbacks can end up keeping a lot more code alive, even if they are never used. We'll get back to this later. Oh boy. Similarly, say you print a string via display. Well, now not only are you bringing in the whole buffered IO facility, but you're also calling a highly polymorphic function. Display can print anything. There's a case for bit vectors, so you pull in code for bit vectors. There's a case for pairs, so you pull in code for that too. Yeah, the thought that display can print anything means you either have to rewrite display to display different types, or you just deal with it and import everything because display could display anything. Ew. One solution is to instead call write string, which only writes strings and not general data. You'll still get the generic buffered IO facility, though, even if your program only uses one kind of port. This brings me to my next point, which is that optimal tree shaking is a flow analysis problem. Consider display. If we know that a program will never have bit vectors, then any code in display that works on bit vectors is dead, and we can fold the branches that guard it. But to know this, we have to know what kind of arguments display is called with, and for that, we need higher level flow analysis. Problem is exacerbated for Python in a few ways. One, because object-oriented dispatch is higher order programming. How do you know what foobar actually means? depending on foo, which means you have to thread around representations of what foo might be everywhere, into everywhere's caller, into everywhere's caller's caller, and so on. This is a very important point. I've covered static Hermes a bit in the past. So if you're somehow not familiar with static Hermes, it's a JavaScript compiler that compiles your JS to basically be native assembly code. This example here is from the presentation. You can watch my whole video about static Hermes. I'm sure if you search Hermes Theo, I'll come up pretty quickly. The goal here is to show that you kind of need type safety in order for this to work. Because if you're dealing with all the different types of data that can pass around and you're doing that at a low enough level, things get messy. The other problem is what Python is dealing with there, where if your language is unsound and you want to figure out what is and isn't being used, it's really difficult to do such. In Hermes, in static Hermes, the solution is to have really strict compiler rules where you have to have type definition so that the compiler knows what the data is actually shaped like and what it actually is supposed to do. So it's weird to think in order to use the static JS compiler to make your JS faster, you can actually write JavaScript. You have to write flow or TypeScript because you need the type definitions in order for this to work and behave as expected. Crazy when you think about it, but it, it does make sense and it is important that they're handling these problems because we need this to work and we need this to work well, which again is what makes this so interesting is that since these languages we want to use don't have these strict definitions, compiling to figure out what we do and don't need is nearly impossible. If we don't have that data included in our code definitions, it doesn't exist. So now we have to generate it. And that generation is an incredibly difficult challenge that seems like everyone else is struggling with here too, specifically the idea of higher level flow analysis. Secondly, lookup in Python is generally more dynamic than in Scheme. The next point he makes is even more things that are hard because Python's dynamic. And since Python's dynamic, we don't have any idea what it needs almost ever. But finally, and perhaps relatedly, the object of tree shaking in Python is a mess of modules rather than a big term with lexical bindings. This is like JavaScript, but without the established ecosystem of tree shaking bundlers, Python has its work cut out for some years to go. In short, with Garbage Collection, Waza makes it thinkable for the first time to do DOM programming in languages other than JS. It will only be feasible for mass use, though, if the resulting Waza modules are small, and that means significant investment on each language's toolchain. Often, this will take the form of alternative toolchains that incorporate experimental tree shaking algorithms and whose alternative standard libraries facilitate the tree shaker. Well, I'm off to lunch. Happy Waza bling, comrades. This is a phenomenal post. This was from back in 2023, near the end of the year. Yeah, Wingo Log, you killed it. This was dope. Yeah, I had suspicions and beliefs about a lot of these things, but I did not think anywhere nearly this strongly about it. Yeah, definitely recommend checking out his blog if you're curious. There's a lot of cool stuff here. Links in the description as always. That was a great article. I was always skeptical of Wasm in the browser, but yeah, this puts my points better than me and shows even more challenges I hadn't imagined yet. Curious what you guys think, though. Is the future one where we have more Wasm in the browser and we're using other languages, or are we stuck with JavaScript forever? Let me know what you think and definitely check the blog out. Until next time, peace nerds.